You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Have you found the keys to unlock your best trip? On a Trafalgar tour, you unlock more than just the world. We give you the keys to discover real connections and one-of-a-kind experiences. It all starts with expert itineraries where everything is taken care of. With Trafalgar, your money goes further, and so do you. Unlock your best self. Discover more at trafalgar.com slash unlock. That's T-R-A-F-A-L-G-A-R dot com slash unlock. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way. Hello everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War, episode 55. For those of you who are listening along as the episodes are released, you may have noticed that it has been several weeks since episode 54 came out. Unfortunately, a few days before this episode was originally supposed to be released, I broke my foot, which caused a trip to the emergency room, several hours spent in the hospital, and a regimen of some pretty hefty painkillers. Then, a week ago, I had to go into surgery to try and put my foot back together again, and ended up with several large pieces of metal screwed into it. Because of this experience, I'm not sure exactly what the release schedule for this podcast will look like in the coming weeks. It is very likely that I will miss a few more weeks here and there. I would also like to take this opportunity to impart a small bit of advice to all of my listeners, and here it is. Breaking your foot is a very bad idea. Try not to do it. But anyway, that's enough about me. This episode begins our three-episode stretch of episodes, focusing on the war in the Middle East. We have already discussed the actions at Gallipoli and in the Caucasus. But those two theaters are just part of the war that was waged between the British and the Ottomans. It was a side theater during the war, for sure. It would not have the resources or the action of other fronts. But for three years, the conflict raged, and it would lead to decisions made after the war that would change the course of the Middle East for the rest of the 20th century and beyond. The British will be the primary drivers of action during these episodes, which will cover the events from November 1914 to the very beginning of 1916. On this episode, we will try and take a look at the situation in the Middle East before any action occurred. Then next week, we will look at the opening moves in the theater, and a surprising, at least to me, attack by the Ottomans against the Suez Canal in Egypt. Finally, the third episode of the trio will follow the British attack from the shores of the Persian Gulf into Mesopotamia, that ends in a tiny village that you may have heard of by the name of Kut, which would be the location of a British military disaster. Let's start off with talking about the Ottoman Empire. We have already discussed the Ottoman world in 1914, in some general and in some specific terms, but I thought I would do a bit of a refresher before moving on to new material. The Ottoman Empire was in decline in 1914, and it had been for quite some time. In the years before the war, it had lost a huge amount of territory and population due to wars with European states and also internal conflicts. This included the Italian invasion of Libya in 1911, the Balkan Wars, and the Egyptian situation, which we will discuss here in just a moment. The Balkan losses were the most severe due to the concentration of population and resources in the area. But even with these losses, the empire still was responsible for thousands of miles of coastline that it had to try and defend from invasion should war come, which doesn't even take into account all of its land borders. It was simply impossible to properly defend all of these areas all the time. This problem was not helped at all by the fact that huge portions of this land was isolated on the other side of deserts. In some of the more distant regions of the empire, like, say, Mesopotamia, the Ottomans barely had any real power at all. In these areas, the Ottoman power in the region were concentrated heavily in the urban areas, but out in the less populated tracts, it was often under the control of local tribal leaders that were only, sort of, on the Ottoman side. It was by no accident that the British would focus on these areas during the war, 
The lack of power in these distant regions of the empire not only made it difficult to resist invasions, but it also made it difficult to properly use the resources of those regions during the war. Kristen Ulrichsen, in his book The First World War in the Middle East, would have this to say on the topic, that it, quote, resulted in a legacy of limited extractive capabilities that undermined the Ottoman attempts to mobilize local resources during the First World War, end quote. Empires throughout history could tell you that if you don't maintain powers in regions of your empire, it is impossible to mobilize those regions during a crisis period. A great example of this would be Libya in 1911. When the Italians invaded, the local population, which had only been loosely ruled by the Ottomans, just sort of shrugged and went on with their lives. Going back to Ulrichsen for another quote here. Quote, This was, in large part, attributed to the Ottomans' inability to create a common identity among the peoples they governed, to construct a viable economic alternative to the gradual erosion of the traditional caravan-based trading systems, or to reformulate notions of regional political authority, which remain stubbornly tribal and local. End quote. Up until this point in our discussions of the Ottoman participation in the war, we've always been talking about areas that were strongly under the control of Constantinople. Gallipoli is just a stone's throw from the capital. The Caucasus region is still reasonably close to the Turkish core of the empire. The areas that we will be discussing over the next few episodes will be far from these areas, which is why we will spend so much time talking about local groups and local leaders whose loyalties were always negotiable. This moves into another topic that I wanted to retouch on now before we moved on, and that is the topic of nationalism. Nationalism and its growth in the early 20th century had huge effects on Europe, as we talked about in the early episodes of the podcast, but it also had effects on the Ottoman Empire. The idea of a national identity had already cost the Ottomans their holding in, in the Balkans, but it wasn't as advanced throughout most of the Middle East, and probably that is most attributable to what we just talked about, the lack of government power. There is very little need to rebel against a government that barely has any control. Doing so would be a high-risk, low-reward scenario. However, as the war progressed, and the armies arrived, and Ottoman power became more manifest, tribal leaders could be convinced to side with the British, with promises of independence after the war. What was a high-risk, low-reward situation before the war became a low-risk, high-reward scenario, with the presence of the British backing and the increasing annoyance from Constantinople. This would be a small problem for the empire in 1915, but as the war progressed, it would become much, much worse. Before the war was over, not only would there be nationalistic ideas in Mesopotamia, but also in Syria and Lebanon, which are far closer to Constantinople. There will be a lot of talk later about what happened in the Middle East after the war and what the British did to it, so much so that you'll probably be completely sick of it. Suffice to say now that in the late and post-war period, this nationalism and how the British and French interacted with it when breaking up the Ottoman Empire would cause problems, serious, serious problems. So I have talked a lot about the Ottoman Empire, but the other primary driver of Middle Eastern events were the British. They were active in two areas that we will talk about today, Egypt and Mesopotamia. One of the important facts that you may not know, and that to be completely honest, I didn't know going into this episode, was that Egypt was not a British colony before the war, at least technically. In fact, not only was it not a British colony, but it was part of the Ottoman Empire. Just to heap some confusion into the pot here, it wasn't ruled by the Ottomans, it was instead a vassal state that had full autonomy. This meant that it had its own ruler, its own finances, and its own alliances. I would not be surprised if you thought that it was a British colony, though. So far in this podcast, I've spent a reasonable amount of time talking about the British preparing to defend Egypt, massing troops from India and Australia in Egypt, and generally placing a very high importance on Egypt in their war plans. Even if it wasn't a colony, it was still extremely heavily influenced by the British and other Europeans. And all of this started around the time of the creation of the Suez Canal. <laughs> 
The debt accrued by creating the canal caused a lot of problems for the Egyptian government and resulted in the sale of the Egyptians' share of the canal being sold to the British, with the other half already being owned by the French. This gave the British and the French a vested interest in the country and resulted in several important parts of the government being completely controlled by British and French officials. So while technically Egypt was an autonomous state, it was really just a puppet state controlled by the British and the French. There were not many troops in the region during this time, though. Before the war, the British only had about 5,000 men in the country, almost entirely tasked with protecting the canal. When the war started, all of that changed, of course. First, it was the territorial troops from the home islands that arrived to replace the regular troops that were on station. Then it was the colonial troops on their way to Gallipoli and the Western Front. When the Ottoman Empire declared war, Egypt was declared a British protectorate. And now what this really meant for Egypt is that it went from having a puppet government that was controlled by the Europeans to having another puppet government that was controlled by the Europeans. Now with the Ottoman entry into the war, the protection of Egypt became the number one concern of British Middle Eastern policy. Everything that was done was second to making sure that Egypt and its canal were safe from interference. With the situation in Egypt completely clear, let's talk about Mesopotamia. The Ottomans were still in control of Mesopotamia, and there isn't some confusing explanation about it. Even before the war started, though, the British were very invested in keeping it free of Ottoman influence, at least as much as possible. In the years before the war, the British had become very dependent on oil from the Persian Gulf states, none more so than the British Royal Navy, who was switching all of its furnaces from coal to oil fired. Before the war, the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Lansone, even said that any country making naval bases or fortified areas in the Gulf region would be seen as a direct threat to British interests. With the British so invested in the area, it should be noted that they did not see the Ottomans as the primary threat. Instead, they saw the Russians as the biggest concern. The Great Game had been ongoing for almost a century, with the British and the Russians vying for influence in the Middle East. The animosity between the nations had lessened in the years before the war, after some treaties had been signed. However, the Russian concern would just find itself replaced by concern over German encroachment in the Gulf region. The German threat peaked before the war, when the Ottomans partnered with Germany to begin creating a railroad that would span the entire distance between Constantinople and the Persian Gulf. This would have completely changed the political and economic situation in Mesopotamia, which was somewhat isolated from the rest of the empire at this time. It would also have changed the fact that the area around the Persian Gulf had more economic ties with Britain and India than it had with the rest of the Ottoman Empire. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. So with these facts in mind, it seems reasonable to assume that the British would look to invade Mesopotamia. So let's dig into that situation a little more. Peter Hart, in his book The Real War, would have this to say about why British would invade. Quote, The occupation of Mesopotamia might raise British prestige, and it might annoy Turkey, 
but could not endanger her power of resistance. Although its origin was sound, its development was another example of drift, due to the inherent faultiness of Britain's machinery for the conduct of war, end quote. While the securing of the Gulf Coast would be very easy, especially with the power of the Royal Navy, and it would go a long way to guarantee the oil supplies, besides these reasonably small gains, it would be difficult for a British army to accomplish very much in the region. There were very few roads, and the army would be almost entirely dependent on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers for supply and communication. There was also some pretty hefty distances involved between meaningful objectives. But the British would eventually invade. They were just absolutely going to. And those plans would come out of a committee created in 1914, before the Ottoman entry in the war. One of the members of the committee was Sir Mark Sykes. Sykes had traveled extensively through the Middle East before the war, and had at least some knowledge of the location and its customs. Kitchener took a specific interest in the Middle Eastern affairs, and Sykes was seen as his mouthpiece on the committee. Because of this fact, and his seemingly great knowledge of the region, Sykes would naturally, over time, sort of take over the committee. Many things were discussed at this time, before the Ottoman entry into the war, and not just about what would happen if war came, but also what would happen when, of course not if, the British were victorious. The plan was already being put in place to completely redraw the map of the Middle East. Near the end of 1914, Sykes took a tour of the British holdings in the Middle East. During his trip, he would visit many locations in Egypt, the Persian Gulf, Mesopotamia, and India. The first and last of these destinations, India and Egypt, were the most important. On his first stop in Egypt, he was told by the British officials there that the population of Syria was ready for British rule and would welcome them gladly. This moved Sykes towards a campaign, with the prospect of great help in the Syria region. There were also many discussions about what would happen to the Middle East after the war while Sykes was in Egypt. Two of the core tenets that the British officials in Egypt believed was that the Arabs could and should have independent rule after the war. It was, however, important that the seat of the Caliphate, which currently resided in Constantinople, be moved further south, away from Russian influence. Even though Britain and Russia were allies in the war, there was still concern about their role afterwards. When he departed Cairo, Sykes had begun to formulate his own ideas on what he would report in London on his return, but then he went to India. India would play the primary role in any Middle Eastern campaign, in terms of manpower and support, so it was important that Sykes and the Viceroy, Charles Harding, were on the same page. But they were not. The first disagreement revolved around independent rule and its place in the post-war Middle East. Independent rule, and if it would be supported by Britain after the war, was important because it would almost certainly be a discussion point with any possible British ally that was currently a leader within the Ottoman Empire. This could include tribal leaders in the desert or just any other leaders within the Ottoman society that Britain was trying to bring to their side. The Viceroy would write after Sykes left that, quote, Sykes does not seem to be able to grasp the fact that there are parts of Turkey unfit for representative institutions, end quote. When Sykes left, several of the topics were left unresolved, and when he returned to London, he would propose that a new government entity be created that would handle all British policy in the Middle East. There was currently the committee to advise, but it held no real power over the two closest British officials in the region, which were stationed in Egypt and India. Sykes would propose that a body be created to oversee the Middle East, and it should be stationed in Cairo, and, of course, he should lead it. This would allow him to get around any differences in opinion between the leaders of Egypt and India. This body, which would be called the Arab Bureau, would be created in 1915 and would have authority to conduct the war in the Middle East, allowing it to utilize the resources of India and Egypt in a coordinated manner. A critical part of the Bureau's job would be in interacting with and maintaining relations with Arab tribes in the Ottoman territories. Kitchener and the men in London had started focusing on how they could instigate rebellion amongst the discontented Arab leaders since the start of the war, and now it was time to finally make it happen. With the British emphasis on attracting the Arab tribes to support their war, it is time to introduce a new character into our story, 
I use the word character here very carefully because Muhammad Sharif al-Faruqi has a very interesting story. When the Ottomans entered the war, he was a lieutenant in the Ottoman army. He was also a member of a secret society in Damascus. The Ottomans were very concerned about these secret societies and the possibility of them leading rebellions. For this reason, al-Faruqi was sent to the Gallipoli Front. While on the Gallipoli Front, al-Faruqi would seize the opportunity to desert over to the British side, and once captured, he claimed to have very important information for British intelligence. The information that he claimed to possess would, in his mind, allow the British to easily triumph in the Middle East. Al-Faruqi spoke only small pieces of broken English, and there is some debate among historians on how much of his information was interpreted accidentally incorrectly, was purposefully misleading, or was a result of the British hearing what they wanted to hear. What the British understood from Al-Faruqi was that he was a representative of the Arab secret society Qa'ab el Aad, and that he had the authority to speak for the society. From my lead-up and my phrasing of that sentence, you may have already realized that he was neither of those things. He had duped the British, mostly due to the fact that he had knowledge of communications that had been sent to the leader of al Aad, Sharif Hussein. He came by this knowledge from his friends in Damascus. Sharif Hussein was the emir of Mecca, and the British knew that Hussein had power, and they had been in contact with him since before the war started. Hussein had sent a list of demands to Cairo that had to be met before Hussein would support the British in the war. The biggest of these demands was that Hussein would be made an independent ruler after the war. The British began to consider giving in to Hussein's demands partially because of information given to them by al-Faruqi, who claimed that Hussein had at his command hundreds of thousands of Ottoman soldiers and millions of Ottoman subjects. Neither of those things were correct either. Another nugget of information obtained from al-Faruqi was that the British had to answer quickly or Hussein would put all of his support behind the Ottomans. So, believing that it was a huge step towards winning the war, the British reached an agreement with Hussein and believed that, when the time came, there would be a massive revolt against Ottoman rule. After all of these pieces of information were provided by al-Faruqi, he found himself in an interesting position. Due to how he was being used by both sides in the negotiations, both of them, the British and Hussein, believed that al-Faruqi was the representative of the other side. This put al-Faruqi squarely at the center of all of the conversations and the negotiations. As the months went by, Sykes became more and more convinced that, after the information obtained about Hussein, it was absolutely essential that the British get as many Arab leaders on their side in the coming conflict as possible. This caused a ton of time spent on diplomatic back-and-forth conversations, where boundaries, promises, demands, counter-demands, and deals were made, changed, remade, and rechanged. These efforts were thought to be extremely important, both in Cairo and in London. In reality, Hussein had no army and the following of the secret societies were much smaller than reported, and the loyalty of the Arab tribes was found to be very fluid. Sykes, however, accepted all of the deals reached and promises made at face value, and used them in his further decision-making. The one that decision that this led to, and often the one action that was required by the British in their treaties, was that there would be no Arab revolt until there were British boots on the ground in the Middle East. Next week, we will find out how they got there.